Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our final reception and exhibit opening for the year of Beck. It's wonderful to see all of you here. And whether you've been here for all four receptions, which I know some of you have, or whether this is your first one, we're glad you're with us tonight. It indeed has been a year of celebration. We've had a glimpse back into history, discovered previously on exhibited pieces of Beck artwork, and experienced countless gestures of appreciation and respect for a local artist. I want to thank those who have been instrumental in dreaming, designing, and executing such a variety of events in our community this year. The Cabot's Year of Beth Committee was orchestrated by Beth Richardson as she came in to help us in an interim position, and she kept our committee on top of things and moving for close to two years we've been, been planning this year. Our new gallery staff, Nancy Valentine and Stacy Wendt, hit the ground running when they started early this year with all the additional duties a celebration such as this entailed. They don't know what normal life is like in the gallery yet, and maybe there never will be. <laughs> Jess Torgerson stayed connected to gallery staff and was a tremendous asset in developing the four Cadets exhibits with Stacy. Board members Rebecca Peterson and Linda McFarland, with their can do and why not try it attitudes, enhanced many of the year's activities. And thanks to former board member and executive director, Brooke Barsness, and former board member, Steve Gatormson, who joined the committee to share their expertise and talents. This team made it all happen, but many of you stepped in to volunteer when asked, and you came to enjoy the shows that we had in support of the events of the year. Away from the Cadets Gallery, M State hosted an impressive Beck Alumni Art Show, which was organized and curated by Brooke Arsness and Lori Charest. We want to thank Gail Hedstrom and the Fergus Falls Public Library staff who exhibited pieces from the alumni show at our library, and Kathy Evabel at Outer Tail County Historical Society, who put out a call for people to bring in their Beck artwork and that's in an exhibit that will be on display at the museum till the end of the year. And then a huge thank you to Chuck Christensen, who has played a significant role in the exhibition of Beck work this year. Chuck, a former student of Beck's, has dug through files of Dad's artwork, poured over sketchbooks, and more than once said to me, you can't throw that away. <laughs> Chuck knows Dad better as an artist than anyone. To see his joy when a piece from way back was discovered, to feel the respect he has for the history, and to watch him use his skills to make these pieces come to life was incredible. Tonight, in this room, all around us, are examples of Chuck's restoration work. And I'm going to ask Chuck to come up for just a couple of minutes to tell us about some of the pieces that he's gotten ready for this display. <laughs> well, last Thursday I left New York and uh, it was kind of a wild uh, uh, three, four day event where we got in New York about 3 p.m. Uh, I got to the Chain of Cross Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art. I went there three times. I went to the Guggenheim. I went to the Whitney and the Met twice. I went to the Opera. And I went to the ABC dance show. But anyway, at the Whitney, I noticed there was two artists from Minnesota. One was uh, George Morrison, born in 1919. Uh, from Grand Forge, Minnesota. Another one is a very talented another artist named Andrea Carlson from uh, Grand Marais. I mean, three 
35 miles away. What's, what's the water like? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm looking around. There's no Charlie Pack. There should be a Charlie Pack. And I think, you know, in a matter of time, maybe 50 years, but I think there will be. Isn't this good enough to be in the room? Mm. Museum of Modern Art, my, my favorite floors are the, are the fifth and sixth floors. Modern art from, you know, from uh, Parisian modernism to American modernism. Love it. There's a, on the second floor, there's a gallery called the uh, Art After 1970. You go in there and go, what the hell happened? <laughs> it's like, this, this needs a room at Charlie Beck. I mean, it's awful. So anyway, I mean, Charlie is so underrated. And what I've learned about this year with Charlie is there's always work that are coming to us somehow. And there's so much good quality. And if you could put all that quality in a room, you could fill the sixth floor of the Whitney, and it would be a phenomenal show. Be that good. So there's a few pieces I, I want to just uh, talk about a little bit. So the smaller woodcuts between the larger woodcuts are basically uh, woodcuts that Charlie chose not to make an addition of. Why? I'm not sure, because they're actually better than some of the ones he did. <laughs> And, and so there's a, you know, the boundary line. That one might have been just a real fair cat to print. There was three versions. He decided to throw two of them. So that's the only one. This one, I think Carolyn thought was a watercolor, but it's actually a woodcut. The only one known. This one, I think there was three versions of it, or three, three, uh, three prints of it. The two above, over there next to the collage, um, they were actually, I think, Wood test that he was maybe checking out the sharpness of his tool. <laughs> At least the bottom one. The bottom one was not printed. I printed it was on the back side of, uh, of the small fog field. I thought this is too cool not to print. And the one next to it, um, Carolyn brought me a, a box of scraps, of the lettering scraps from the 50s. Okay, I'm supposed to do something with it. So. <laughs> I made this collage, and I, you know, I used to play a lot of Scrabble with my, with my grandparents. So I know all these weird, obscure words. So it says, you know, if you look at it, it looks like Wild Gascon. Well, Gascon is a, it's actually a city in France, but it's also kind of a noxious person who brags about what their abilities and what they might have. So anyway, and then if you look at other ways, you can find other words too. But anyway, that just kind of, kind of happened. And uh, the other works that I didn't, there's so much stuff I didn't even know existed. And part of them, uh, the other ones were the, uh, were the bird form cutouts that you would make before you made a bird. I didn't know you did that. So another, Carolyn comes over and makes me a box of dusty, you know, pieces of wood, you know. Of, I said uh, to throw it away. Yeah, I mean, she's always <laughs> trying to throw things away. No, 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 no. You know, so anyway, what I did is uh, some had some were attached and some heads were just you know, missing with with a, with a with a body. So they, for when, for instance, the loons, there were these wonderful loon heads, and but there were no loon bodies. So I tweaked the ducks, some of the ducks to look like loons. So it's kind of a collaboration. And then the other ones that I kind of had a part of was. Uh, there's a, uh, I call it a wood relief over by um, Mr. Morton's in there. And uh, that one, a mouse, a mouse peed on. And I tried to get this smell away. I used, like, I just, the cat just got ear to go for cats and dogs back in where I tried to have giant fingers and nothing worked. And I, I did it so many times, I was sniffing all the time. I was midnight one night, I could not get that smell out of me. <laughs> so I, anyway, so I, then I sealed it in that kind of way. So Carolyn said, I don't want anything to do with it. So I thought, well, I'll just make it into something else. So I, I cut the bottom off, and then um, I, I kind of assembled it as a, it just kind of an abstraction. And you know, if you look at the carving, the carving is phenomenal. And then there was another version, the next, uh, 
the firewall there. Um, that one actually has the, the, the urine stain on it. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, a lot of modern art is about accidents. <laughs> so I thought, well, the mouse did this. And so if you still, if you sniff it, you can kind of still smell it. So you know, there's expressionism, there's expressionism, and now there's smellism. <laughs> On behalf of my mom, Joyce, and the entire Beck family, I want to thank, say thanks to each of you for celebrating with us, for your enthusiasm in viewing and reacting to all the variety in Dad's artistic journey, and for the ways in which you have recognized his legacy this past year. Dad, throughout his life, just seemed to do what he needed to do. We did not always know what drove him to keep going, to try new techniques, to head in different directions, but he seemed to find joy and purpose in it all. He surprised us, he inspired us, and he never quit until he physically could not draw again. We thank you for over the years for encouraging him for discussing his art with him and for affirming him. We are truly grateful to this community. This past year has been an overwhelming and an emotional journey for all of us. And it is our hope that Charles Beck's art and his love for this community in which he grew up will continue to inspire you and will continue to be remembered. Thank you. My name is Nancy Shell Valentine, and I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of American Private Galleries. I am tasked with introducing the wonderful Brian Sott, and I'm excited to share a little bit about why it is that we invited him to be here today. Brian Sott is a recently retired person. After a 35 year career as an art historian, uh, he had an incredible 20 year tenure at the Minnesota Historical Society. Before that, he spent nearly a decade as the director of the Epitaph Gallery at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And with a specialty in the history of art making in Minnesota, he's organized numerous exhibitions, such as Seth Eastman, Artist on the Frontier, Charles Beck, an artist for all seasons, Clouds and Shadows, and in 2022, Art Speak. Zott is also the co-author of the 2015 publication, Minnesota Modern, Four Artists of the 20th Century, and he received his graduate degree in museum studies from the University of Minnesota. So without further ado, please help me welcome Brian Zott. <laughs> okay, we're going to go without the mic. That way I can have my hands free. Uh, thank you, uh, really, uh, Carolyn and Nancy, for inviting me to be here tonight. I couldn't be happier uh, to be in Fergus Falls 
And, uh, you know, uh, I was asked what I was going to speak about. It was about my reflections on Charles Beck's legacy. Uh, his legacy is assured just by the number of people who are here tonight. I was talking to Bill, uh, uh, who happens to be from my hometown of Danville, Illinois, small world that it is. Uh, and he asked me how I knew about Charles, or how did I learn about Charles? And uh, when I was at Minneapolis College of Art and Design, I had hired a young guy out of McAllister as a gallery, my assistant at the gallery uh, uh, from Fergus, a guy named Greg Fitz, who ended up being a gallery director at um, McAllister uh, Gallery, and I think he's out on the West Coast. And he just couldn't stop talking about this guy named Charles Beck, and how come I hadn't heard about him? So that was probably about 1995, and that was my first introduction to Charles's work. Uh, and but when I then arrived, uh, at the Minnesota Historical Society, my interest grew because uh, of his, uh, an, an artist working out state with such high standard and high quality work. It was, uh, it was a no brainer for me uh, to, to get to know Charles uh, better and his work. Um, uh, Carolyn asked me to start out by talking a little bit about the Minnesota Historical Society and its fine art collection and how it, it evolved. So I do want to spend a few minutes on that. And then I want to share with you some of my thoughts about, uh, well, I guess about greatness, uh, but about what makes, uh, what makes an artist great or what makes a work of art great. Just, and I've been thinking about this off and on uh, since retirement. Um, but first about the Minnesota Historical Society. Currently, uh, the fine art collection numbers 6,000 works of art. Um, that's fine art, so that's paintings, sculptures, works on paper, uh, uh, pr uh, printmaking, of course, and um, not the sort of arts like quilt making and other, and other uh, art forms, Native American work, for example. This was a traditional category of fine art, and that was I was responsible for uh, collecting and preserving that collection. When I started, the collection was about 5,000, so during my tenure, I added about 1,000 works of art uh, to the collection, which, of which I'm very proud of. The Historical Society started collecting artwork since its founding in 1849. And so its mission was to collect artwork uh, about Minnesota and its people. And of course, as you would expect in 1849 onward, that was mostly lands Minnesota iconic landscapes and individuals, portraits. And that forms the core of, the, uh, of our collection, at least at, at its founding. Um, so the... Um, our, our, our collecting uh, focus on our portraits and landscapes. And then after decades of collecting, what we uh, realized is that our, we, a new mission evolved or a secondary mission evolved in our collecting. And that really was to document the history of art making in Minnesota. You know, with, with, with the advent of the camera and the visual culture that emerged over the 20th century, uh, Document, collect, telling Minnesota's history through art became less and less of a uh, mandate. And so we, we and my predecessors kept collecting. So what we really ended up with this great decade by decade collection of art making. And one of the first things I realized upon my arrival was that art making in Minnesota, every decade since say the 1850s have been really remarkably strong. I don't know if it's the water, someone mentioned the water earlier, <laughs> or the air we breathe. But um, really, uh, it's an extraordinary 175-year uh, collection. So when I arrived, I took that, uh, I took that uh, history, collecting the history of art making in Minnesota, uh, really seriously and doubled down. And my responsibility was to bring the collection up through the 20th century and into the 21st century. After all, uh, you think of a historical society, you think of sort of the his historic 19th, early 20th century work. But because we had such a vibrant uh, collection, uh, I continued to strengthen the work from the 20th century and collected the first work created you know, for the collection in the 21st century and uh, a number of living artists. And I could talk about that later if we have time, but it was really a fascinating experience uh, for me and a great opportunity. Um, you know, so the primary goal is to survey or sample the, the, the art making. But when I arrived, I realized that some artists, whether by design or not, the Historical Society collected deeply. They went deeper down. And of course, one of the first artists of that was Seth, East, Seth Eastman, which was mentioned about the exhibition. And he was a soldier artist stationed at Fort Snelling. 
uh, in the 1830s and 40s, and we have a large number of uh, watercolor drawings uh, by Seth Eastman. And other artists in the 19th century, late 19th, early 20th century, like Alexis Fournier and Nicholas Brewer, uh, they were deep. Now, Nicholas Brewer makes sense because he was a portrait painter. So if you're going to collect portraits, you better collect his work because he was a fine portrait painter. Uh, and during my time at MHS, I uh, continued that practice a little bit more deliberately. So when I was there, I wanted to collect clusters of artwork like uh, mid-century artists like Cameron Booth or Alof Wedeen or Clara Marsh or Clem Hoppers, where I wanted to have an extensive a large number of works available by that particular artist. And I also at that time started going deep on collecting uh, contemporary artists. So certainly uh, an artist named Mike Lynch, who grew up on the Iron Range, lived in the Twin Cities, uh, recently passed away this summer. Uh, Dan Brueggemann, who's just recently retiring from Carleton College. And of course, uh, Charles Beck. And an example of that is, um, what we have in our collection. So we have a, a total of 20 works of art uh, by Charles in our collection, uh, mostly woodcuts, uh, some paintings, and a pair of uh, fabulous life-size turkeys. <laughs> Amazing. And, uh, but, and our first, we first collected his work in 1980. Of that 20, though, 15 were acquired during my tenure, and two are on cue to be acquired from an estate that we had negotiated while I was there. So this is an example of my deliberate effort to kind of develop particular artists more thoroughly. Um, there's a reason for that, obviously for research, because uh, someone coming in studying art in Minnesota, you want to focus on certain individuals. So obviously, if I had a researcher coming in wanting to know about art in Minnesota, I would certainly want to show uh, and have work on view by uh, Charles, or available by Charles Beck. Uh, it also allows us to do uh, in-depth exhibitions. So in 2018, I organized an exhibition, the, the Charles Beck and Artists for All Seasons. Half the work is from our collection, and half it was loaned mostly from the, the Beck family. But that gives us an idea of our, our, our efforts to focus on one art, artist uh, particularly. Um, so we're all familiar with, with Charles's bio, and I won't, I'll just touch upon it briefly because you guys know Charles better than I do. Um, but before World War II, he uh, studied at Concordia College with an artist uh, named Cyrus Running, and I think that's where he learned his sort of uh, modernist sensibilities, his sort of flattening of the picture plane, uh, and just sort of got a, a really good uh, foundation in art making. After World War II, he received his MFA in 1950 from the University of Iowa, which you might not know. In the, in the 1950s, uh, University of Iowa, Iowa was a hotbed of sort of uh, abstract painting in, uh, in the United States. It was a, had a really aggressive uh, and ambitious studio arts program with visiting artists coming through. So it was a, a really a, a fabulous time for Charles to be a student in Iowa in uh, 1950. 1953, he does some postgraduate work uh, in uh, Minneapolis with Cameron Booth, who I mentioned a moment ago. 1953, Cameron Booth was uh, doing some of his best abstract work uh, of his career. He also met and worked with Malcolm Myers, who was the Minnesota's premier printmaker. So you know he couldn't have had a better, better pedigree in terms of where he, where he did his studies. Um, uh, Beck often said this, uh, and you've all heard it. First, you have to have an idea, and then you've got to have a plan, and then you've got to be open to the mistakes that happen along the way. And you know that, in a way, is a very brief summary of what modernism is about, is the importance of the idea, the uh, preeminence of the artist's idea, and then the opportunity's contribution is. And of course, um, yeah, in a nutshell, it's his, his landscapes. You know, he was a keen uh, observer of the natural world in all its variations and all its seasons. And um, I, I described it like a portrait painter. Uh, he understood the anatomy of the landscape. He understood, if you, if you allow, the sort of bones and sinews of uh, the landscape, what lies beneath uh, the ground in terms of what forms a landscape, uh, what, what lies below the uh, 
uh, surface. When, um, and, and the result of this is intimacy with the landscape. Uh, you know, he really had a profound sense of place. You know, this region uh, spoke to him and he communicated to that. We respond to it. You, as residents of this region, fundamentally understand it better than anyone. But as Kathy and I were driving in today, we we're enjoying uh, the rainy, but uh, early or mid fall sort of season changing. Leaves were falling, uh, uh, fields were plowed, and there were furrows in. And as we got closer uh, to Fergus, we kept saying, Oh, there's a Charles Beck tree. Oh, there's a there's a landscape. And as you as you came in, you just it just came alive. And how how he was able to capture the sort of contours and undulating nature of this beautiful piece of the planet. Uh, Beck said that uh, he uh, that he should let that we should let nature be the teacher. And I think the landscape of this region was a very good teacher. And I think Charles Beck was a very good student. His second contribution, which I can't really discuss, but I, I'm always, every time I go enter a room of his work, I always marvel at it, is his use of color. And uh, it's unique, it's playful, it's intuitive, it's arbitrary. And when, you, when I asked him about it, when people ask him about it, he kind of sloughs off, so well, you know, I, I had some color around, and this looked interesting, <laughs> and I wanted to use this up. And so I, you know, it, it's, it's like it's some sort of uh, intuitive color theory uh, that he employed that um, that's extraordinary. And one of my favorite works that we included in the Art Speaks exhibition was the, uh, as you are familiar with, it's the um, the multicolored fish houses. You know, I, and I described it in my tours as like opening up a box of candy because there's all these little sparkly <laughs> sparkly objects on there. And, of course, I asked Carolyn if I could use that analogy when I was giving my tours, and she was more than happy with that. But, but really, his sense of color is extraordinary. And um, you know, uh, I, I, I know, I know he, it, it wasn't by chance, but uh, it uh, wasn't based, it, whatever color theory it was, it was his own, and it was unique. So since retiring last year, I've had the opportunity, and this might come as a surprise to you, but I've had the opportunity to think about what makes a work of art great. Uh, and that's odd for an art curator to be saying the 35 years. You know, with all the distractions of my job, with budgets and office politics and staff supervision and COVID and George Floyd, I realized that I hadn't really given that a, much of a thought uh, until retiring. So I really had the, uh, this uh, luxury of time uh, to ponder that. I've also been prompted to ponder that on a couple occasions this summer. In June, I was asked to moderate a panel on the 50th anniversary of Groveland Gallery in Minneapolis, which is you know, uh, uh, no small feat to be in operation uh, for 50 years under the director of one person for 40 of those 50 years. And it's a pretty extraordinary accomplishment. And many of the artists who had been with that gallery for decades were at this panel discussion. In August, I was asked to jury a uh, plein air painting competition in Wisconsin that included amateurs and professionals. Even two high school students were involved in this. So the whole range of art making was included in this uh, celebration of the landscape on the South Shore of Lake Superior. And uh, that gave me lots of opportunity to think about, well, what, what is a good work of art? Is it about how much education the person has or what? And then in September, I was asked uh, to comment on uh, uh, Mike Lynch's legacy and his career in an obituary for the Star Tribune. So all of these sort of things added up and led me to you tonight, which is the other prompt to be thinking about that. So I want to share with you some of my thoughts. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little bit of a work in progress. If you have some questions, I'll be happy to, to deal with it. So uh, bear with me. Um, I'm not sure who said it first, but uh, British artist David Hockney said it uh, most recently. He said that a work of art, and certainly a great work of art, must possess three elements or three qualities. And he described it as the hand, the eye, and the heart. And um, 
Uh, and I want to, I, I thought a lot about, I want to drill down a little bit and we'll start with the eye, which is obvious after all, it's the visual arts, but, but um, artists help us see the world a little bit differently, a little bit more acutely and, um, and, and appreciate it. So the, the fact that it's a visual exchange from what the artist sees and what the artist wants us to see in that work of art, um, they use their eyes to see and express the world uh, so we can see it a little bit differently. You know, it's most fundamental. It's about artists helping us appreciate uh, the beauty of the landscape, whether that's a sunset or a portrait or a cityscape uh, or a red barn. But also abstract artists also uh, want us to see a world of color, of line and form. So whether it's a, whether it's a, a, a an observed object or a, an expressive object like an abstraction, there is this sort of bond between uh, the artist and uh, the viewer. Um, you know, the art is about seeing, and seeing is the primary way for humans to understand the world. There are other, there are other ways, hearing, all the senses, I suppose. But uh, seeing is, is the human's most developed um, sense, and uh, it, artists help, whether it, they're talking about an observed world or they're talking about a personal world, it is um, that act of seeing helps us understand that person's personal truth or personal history. The hand, the second component, the second quality, is obviously about skill. And today, artists employ an entire range of skills and, uh, in, in expressing their work. And the individual artist has to decide to what level the skill should be in order to achieve their visual goals. So, um, you know, art making can range from uh, childlike, uh, untrained, naive, to highly sophisticated drafting skills, sophisticated color theory and paint application. And an individual artist has to develop what that, you know, what uh, that it means for that individual artist. Um, and every artist has to decide that. The heart, which I think is a really key component to art making uh, in the final element here is, um, how the artist, uh, what, the artist what the artist chooses to express and what the artist's voice is. And it's about personal expression. And I think um, Charles, uh, in fact, I just pulled this out of the, of the bowl in the other room, almost at random, and I'm gonna let him do the talking. The prerequisite of the artist is not talent, but imagination, which is terribly needed in society, but not taught. Well, I don't have to talk more about that. So every artist has to decide, you know, when David Hockney made this quote, he didn't, he didn't prescribe a formula, 10% skill, 90% expression. Every individual artist has to decide what that combination is, what that special sauce is to make their work of art successful. And we as viewers can use that same criteria to determine what we like as viewers, because actually appreciating art is a very personal experience. You know, I've got this, I've had this long career observing art. I was listening to, in my insomnia last night, I was listening to this report about this art collector who looks at two or 300 paintings a day. I didn't, I've never looked at 200 paintings a day, <laughs> but I have looked at a whole lot of paintings over 35 years. And I think that the, um, um, uh, we can use, you know, in order to evaluate that, we all have a right to say what we like. I personally like, a work that's a little more abstract, that's heavy on expression. Other people might prefer a work that's highly skilled and it, you, it, you see what you get, what you see, and there's not much personal voice attached to that. That's fine. We have to decide what that uh, special sauce is for us. So I think it's useful for us uh, to think about this concept of the, the, the eye and the hand and um, the heart. There's no right or wrong answer. Every, every, every decision is personal. Um, another concept in, in, in sort of my thinking about greatness is um, the distinction between authenticity and originality. And this is, a, this is a lesson that I've learned since my early days at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. 
because I think young artists um, often confuse originality with authenticity. And of course, the marketplace uh, rewards originality over authenticity. Uh, I think in the Midwest, far away from uh, the East Coast, the West Coast, I think an art, it's important for an artist here uh, in the Midwest to find their authentic self, to find, uh, not be so concerned about their original self. But, and I think that's true for even the most original works of art. But I think in the Midwest, that I think is a really uh, unique uh, characteristic is authentic, you know, the authenticity of the artist and what they're trying to say. It's not that it has to be new, it has to be different, it has to be shocking. Uh, it just has to be authentic. I think it's a sign of maturity. Um, the last concept that I want to share with you is a story about famed cellist uh, Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, he relates the story in an interview uh, that from his earliest days, earliest ages, he wanted to be uh, the best cello player in the world. And he practiced, he practiced, he practiced. And he uh, practiced some more. And uh, finally, he started to earn, as a young man, uh, or even a teenager, critical acclaim uh, for his uh, playing of the cello. And as a young man, he was invited to perform uh, a very famous Bach cello piece. And again, uh, he practiced, and he practiced, and he rehearsed. And he tells the story that uh, in the middle of this performance, he had this epiphany that he didn't just merely want to be a master of perfection, he wanted to be a master of expression. And um, you know, to me, that, that sort of says it all. It changed his outlook forever after that point. And I believe that, that uh, master being a master of expression is key to being a great artist today. 10 or 12 years ago, I had an opportunity uh, to sit down with uh, Charles Beck in an interview. Uh, my son was going to Morris, and so I was able to visit him and then swing by and uh, have a studio visit with uh, Charles. We talked many things over those couple hours, but one thing we talked about that really struck home to me was the distinction between uh, art and illustration. It was obvious that he thought a lot of art today was uh, merely illustration and that it was missing this uh, critical element, which I've identified as the heart. It placed too much emphasis on perfection and not enough on expression. And I've often, uh, and it lacked authenticity. And I often have thought about that conversation in the 12 years since we met and talked about this. Um, so it's, we're, all, we're, we're all in agreement. Charles Beck's a great artist. Uh, he, is, uh, he has a unique and successful combination of eye, hand, and heart. Uh, he's truly authentic, and he is indeed a master of expression. And I think that's his legacy. Now, uh, it, it primarily, you know, there are factors like his overall quality of work. You look here, everywhere you look, the standard is so high. You know, I, I kind of want to see a, a, a failed work because everything is so good. <laughs> everything. And um, so I wonder if there was one. But also, um, you know, the, and the consistency, his work ethic, contribute to his legacy and this consistency of his vision throughout his decades of art making. But there are other factors that are really important uh, about a legacy uh, because some great artists have been forgotten. Uh, and that one is the students who have studied and were influenced by the artist. And I think, you know, you uh, are one of them. And I think this is great. They pass on that, those teachings and that wisdom to other generations. I think uh, a community is very important to one's legacy. And boy, Fergus, you got it, you got it, you got it down when it comes to supporting an artist like Charles Beck. And finally, finally, it's the family that carries on that legacy after the artist's death. And that is a uh, that is a big task. And really, to to the uh, Beck family's credit, to you as the community here, those things will ensure. Uh, Charles's legacy for decades to come. Thank you. <laughs>
is uh, just are there any questions or clarifications? If you disagree with me, I don't want to hear it. But go ahead. Well, I, one thing about uh, you know, I like all of Charles Beck's work, but all of it doesn't necessarily speak to me. Appreciate the excellence and, and uh, the uniqueness and all that. And I can look across one, two, three, four, five different landscapes, different, different, you know, so the imagination is there, the feeling yeah. is there. And it, that one, that one grabbed me. Me too. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, it's funny how that works. And, he must feel something like that when he's speaking. He knows other people are going to look at it. That's and right. He knows some will like this one, some will like that. He likes them all because he wouldn't have made them. Right. But, but the matter is, he knows, and, and he, he made that because it satisfied him. Right. But I think he knew somewhere along the line somebody grabbed it. <laughs> 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 well, uh, you know, I think uh, what's interesting also when you look in this room, how much he pivoted between abstraction and, you know, observation and even throughout his career, you know, and I think that um, uh, his earlier work, uh, you know, were, were, I think, not always more abstract, but his earlier work was very abstract and again, very, very good in terms of color and application and form. So I think the, um, as, as time goes by, the, there is something for everybody when you look at this work. And, uh, you know, and, if, and, and I think you pre, if you'd never been to this part of uh, Minnesota, you would still be able to appreciate it because he really fundamentally understands how the landscape unfolds before your eyes. Any comments, questions? Yes. I can see the edge to your hands. It's kind of like this. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, you know, he he made a he made a commitment to this community, and um, you know there were, there were consequences to that. You know, working in outstate Minnesota as a visual artist is gonna is gonna have a gonna have a uh, an impact on one's career. And I think he uh, had that commitment to this community. He uh, he was generous uh, with his time with students with anybody. You know, I, I, as a, you know, curator, I came in and uh, he, he must have done this a hundred times. And yet he, I think I was there for four hours and he never, he was just such, so generous and so courteous uh, and asking questions that he probably could have said, you know, read this instead of talking. About it. <laughs> anyway, thanks for letting me share that with you. I just think we don't get, we don't get to ponder uh, what it means to uh, to be a great artist, or what it takes to be a great artist, and this is really a wonderful occasion. I'm just thrilled to be here. I can't thank you enough for this opportunity, and uh, talk to you later. Thank you.